Today's topic is serious illness. You might be asking yourself, how do people know when they have a serious illness? I think that's a really good question. You know, do you ask? You know, physicians want to be encouraging, and sometimes because of that, they might say things like, oh, everything is fine, you're doing really well, mm -hmm. um, I'm pleased with how well you are doing, and it might be a little misleading, and you may not realize that what you're up against really is a serious illness. So, you know, sure, it's certainly fine to ask your physician if you have a serious illness. I think that would be a really good opening point for your doctor, and I hope that they would be honest with you. But we've got a list of a few things that you can, you know, listen to and mm -hmm. think about, do I do that or does my loved one have that? And then that kind of helps guide you that you may have serious illness because of these things. And then you can, you know, press your physician to provide more information. Yeah. We don't want to, we speak openly, but we don't want to seem like Dr. Gloom and Doom. I've, I've been called Dr. Death by my family. You know, I've been called Dr. Death and Dr. Doom many times. So yeah, yeah. Glo Dr. Gloom and Dr. Dr. Doom. No, yes. no, we're not that. Well, we just like to be open and honest with our subspecialty. That's our that's our forte. That's our job. That's what we feel to do. And I really believe even if I wasn't this subspecialty, this is the way I would be. How about you? I, I would agree. And I also think that knowledge is power, and mm -hmm. that's what we want to provide. Now, serious illness is not terminal illness. No. That just means that this is a serious illness. So, you know, needing some of these things doesn't mean that you're at the end of life, but it does mean that you may have a serious illness. Yeah, and your body is compromised because you need a machine to help you do your normal activities of daily living. Well, let's just dive right in. Okay, great. So, um, a lot of times people think about what they're eating, right? Yeah. yeah. And um, altered consistency and uh, food and also liquids is... Yeah can be yeah. determinants of a serious illness. Because if you've got a swallowing problem, it doesn't go down the right way, and that's a change that's occurred over time. Um, you're not able to swallow the food because of maybe history of a stroke or some sort of a dysphagia or neurologic problem. I mean, that, mm -hmm. that may indicate that you have serious illness. Yep, or dementia can cause, and then oftentimes when people don't eat as much or they're, mm -hmm. um, their volume of food goes down. That is also indicative of serious illness. So the implications of altered food and fluids and how those how those are, are taken in, uh, amounts, weight, the, all those things can indicate that you may have serious illness. The next one is um, we like to discuss is how many specialists do you have, right? That's, yeah. I mean, I, I had a grandmother that loved all her specialists. She had like eight or nine and until I became a physician, I realized that's a bad, bad situation. Yeah. To be in. If you've got more than three specialists that you have to see on a regular basis, you go multiple times a year to see those three specialists, in addition to your primary care physician, that indicates that you, you may have serious illness. Mm -hmm. Next item we like to discuss is the, the wonderful ventilator, you know? Yeah, that's it's, a scary one. Mm -hmm. People just think the ventilator is just helping them breathe just for a little bit. But if you're on that ventilator for more than three days... Mm -hmm. Your body can kind of get tired mm -hmm. and rely on that ventilator. And it's just like if you've you know sprained your ankle and you have not walked for several days your your legs get weak you know mm -hmm. i i had an acute respiratory illness earlier this summer and so you know i i stopped doing my walking routine and it took me a while to get back mm -hmm. to where i was just because i hadn't been that active so you know same thing your diaphragm gets tired if right. you've been reliant on a breathing machine and it is making your body breathe for you and you've been on that ventilator for more than three days that may be an indicator that that you have serious illness right, right what do you think about bipap well same same thing i mean it's there's a lot of implications that bipap is less invasive right because it's not involving mm -hmm. a tube mm -hmm. down the throat it's just a mask on your face but that is not um, a good uh, situation to be in other otherwise it you can live longer on a bipap there are people that have BiPAPs for weeks, months, you yeah. know, even years, but this means that you are seriously ill. I think being in a hospital, you know, mm -hmm. being admitted to a hospital for a non-elective reason for a medical treatment because of a disease exacerbation, because of, you know, needing blood, you need to have some sort of uh, medication, some sort of treatment or surgery, and you've been there longer than three days, 
for that diagnosis, it, it that may indicate that you have serious illness. Right, right. And oftentimes we see people that come in dehydrated and they'll say, oh, my mom was drinking just fine at home mm -hmm. and she didn't have any symptoms for a urinary tract infection and there's an infection. These are all things that we have to take into consideration and account for what, what is the underlying illness causing all these exacerbations. Yeah, yeah. If you've had to have three admissions in 180 days for, you know, uh, an illness, you know, heart or lung or mm -hmm. kidney problem, or if you've had a urinary tract infection that you've required IV antibiotics for, or dehydrations occurred right. three times in the last 180 days, there, there may be an underlying issue that may mean that you and have a serious to. illness. Yeah. I think it's interesting. I got a phone call yesterday from a friend who called me to say, oh, my mom fell and she fractured her humerus. Well, she just had the arm up by the shoulder. So I said, oh, wow. And then she goes, and then she fell again when she got back from the hospital. So I thought it was interesting. I just let it lie. And then uh, this morning I had a text messages. We took her back to the hospital and she's now in the hospital. So you have to look at what's causing these falls Yeah. and, and really hone in on, yeah, it's great. You got a fracture. You're going to get a cast, but what, what caused the fall? Initially? She doesn't mean it's great. That's, that's her dark sarcasm. Yes. That's um, the gloom and doom in me. <laughs> no, that's the, I think that's how we deal with grim topics is sort of our what macabre sense of humor. Yes. And, yeah. But you, you fall and why are you keep falling? And yes. that keeps you going back to the hospital and you keep having those injuries. There, there may be another process that's occurring that's making you at risk for those falls and it may be a serious illness right. that's happening. Right, right, right. If a person is sleeping in a recliner oh. for a medical reason and they've been mm -hmm. sleeping in that recliner for quite a period of time and it doesn't look like they can sleep in a bed because of that medical illness, that may be an indicator of serious illness. Yeah, and sometimes doctors and uh, don't take the time, physicians do not take the time to even ask those questions. We're kind of spoiled in a sense because we go to people's homes. And we get to see what um, their living environment what, is like. Yeah, their living environment is like. And then that leads you to when you're doing an inpatient consult to ask those questions because mm -hmm. you know how people mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. It's also important to look at people that are on supplemental oxygen. I agree. We all need oxygen. So mm -hmm. when people say, oh, I don't need oxygen, I can tell you I need oxygen. I don't need supplemental oxygen. I'm able to get enough oxygen out of the air I breathe. But everybody needs oxygen. I think mm -hmm. even fish need oxygen. They just have a different way they filter it. Yeah. Filter. But anyway, at any rate, I, I need oxygen, but I don't need supplemental oxygen. And just like Dr. T said, when you need supplemental oxygen on an ongoing basis, that may indicate that you've got a serious illness. Right. Can you blow up a balloon? How's your, how's not just your, your ability to get oxygen, but how is your ability to, you know, use your air, yes, use to your expand oxygen. expand your lungs. Yeah. How far can you walk without being short of breath? Mm -hmm. So the use of supplemental oxygen, I think that may be a good indicator that there could be a potential for serious illness. Yeah. And not to get off topic, but a lot of times people take it less serious if they don't use it all the time, but they may really need it, yeah. but they choose not, not to, to use, use it. it. Right. right. Well, my next one is the golden hour. Oh, yeah. For us in palliative medicine, the golden hour is that first hour that you wake up in the morning. And mm -hmm. can you manage your golden hour by yourself? Can you get up on your own? Can you get to the toilet on your own? Can you brush your teeth and comb your hair mm -hmm. on your own? Can you put on your own clothes? Can you get to the kitchen on your own? And can you get your breakfast? on your own. And for most people that takes about an hour. Right. So your golden hour is is represents your independence. And if you're struggling with your golden hour and your independence during that first hour of the morning, there may be a health issue behind that and it could be an indicator of serious illness if you can't manage your your golden right. hour with independence. Yeah, and we also like to look at the time that it's spent to do those things. That yeah. really can tell you a lot about the patient. And, um, you know, their appearance after they've done all those things yeah. can tell you. And a big, big thing is, you know, we live in Florida, uh, the both of us do. So we take care of patients that are out all, that are, their family is scattered throughout the country. Right, right. right. So um, you have to discuss traveling. There's a lot of people that will say, oh, I haven't gone back up to New York or let's say New Jersey or to the Midwest to see their loved ones. 
Um, and you know, and once you start asking them what what is the real underlying reason? Is it because of uh, physical or debilitation? Mm -hmm. And that really shows uh, serious illness. It's a hardship. Is it a struggle? You know, what's the reason that you're you're not getting out? Now, I, you know, I certainly can respect finances being a of part course. of it. Yeah, but if they're telling you, I just struggle to get there. Um, it's hard for me to be away from home because of my meds, because of maybe oxygen, or because I just can't I just can't be away from home and I need to be close to my doctors or maybe I'm going to get dialysis. You know, there are a lot of medical reasons that prevent people from being able to leave town or that make it a hardship. And that can indicate that they may have serious illness. The decline. Mm -hmm. The decline. I've been told I shouldn't use the before things like that. So we'll just say decline. <laughs> if a person's function is declining, if their cognitive status, their ability to think and remember and to do and use their phone or use their television, and I know we all struggle with you know those types of things at times, but if it's decline over time mm -hmm. that's preventing you from being independent, you, you're not able to be independent with your living, you're not able to be independent with your finances, you're struggling with decisions, that may indicate that that decline is being caused by progressive illness. And it could be that it's a serious illness that's causing that decline over time. And that, that may be one of the indicators that make you prompt to talk to your physician about prognosis mm -hmm. and how serious is my illness. Yeah, and what is the underlying illness causing that? Another big thing is weight loss. You know, everybody, you know, every physician wants to push, you gotta lose weight, your cholesterol is high. But when you have an unattended weight loss or um, and an unexplained weight loss, and we're talking even something like 10% in 90 days, mm -hmm. these are telltale signs of serious illness. So when my clinicians that uh, work under uh, my license will tell me, oh, and the patient's lost a ton of weight. These are big uh, red flags for me. This is when the, I say the hair stands on the back of my neck. Like, what is the underlying cause? This is where why we need to... Why are they losing that weight? Why are we losing the weight? There may be a serious illness behind that mysterious weight loss. Mm -hmm. And then they're also with that weight loss or with the decline, you'll see patients have difficulty in taking their medications, right? They um, are not needing prior medication True. or they're not tolerating their medication. Yeah. These are usually telltale signs that there could be an underlying serious illness. It may be a blood pressure pill. Mm -hmm. I used to have to take three and now I only take two or I just, I used to take my water pill every day and now I need it every other day. Or I can't take that medicine anymore. It makes me nauseated. It makes my heart flutter. Or it drops my blood pressure too low. You know, you, you're just wondering why did they need that medicine before and now they're not able to tolerate it and they need a smaller amount or they don't need it at all. That may indicate that their disease is progressing. Exactly. Exactly. And they need less medication now. Mm -hmm. How about rest periods? Well, um, patients that need to take more rest periods, catch, catch, catch their breath, they lose their strength, or they have um, increased naps or day daytime somnolence. Um, these are all s significant indicators of generalized weakness that can be related to a serious illness. Maybe they used to go out and they would mow the yard and, mm -hmm. and now they mow the yard, but they mow the front yard one day and they mow the backyard the next day. And it's not because a problem with the mower or they were busy or didn't have enough time, but they just could not mow the entire yard. Even though they're still mowing the yard, you, you question what's happening that they can't mow it all mm -hmm. at one time. Or, you know, the person who's an avid walker and they've always, you know, walked a certain distance or a certain time and now they tell you, I can't make that distance anymore. I can't do that time anymore. I have had to decrease the amount of exertion that I do. There may be a serious illness behind that need to reduce the amount of activity that they have and that increase in those rest periods. Big one. Not a surgical candidate. We don't see that a, a often lot. Enough. But there are surgeons who are very concerned about a person's surgical mm -hmm. risk and they'll say, before I do this, you know, procedure or surgery or operation, whether it's just a gallbladder procedure mm -hmm. or maybe a knee replacement, they may say, I need you to get checked by the cardiologist. I need for you to see the anesthesiologist. I want to talk to your pulmonary doctor. And they put up these little obstacles. Yeah. 
And again, we're talking greater than three physicians to clear you for surgery, you really need to be looking at is what's the benefit of that surgery. Right. You become not a surgical candidate. And that's a frightening thing to be told because you may not realize that your illness has become so right. serious. Sometimes that's the first time you do realize it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, especially with cancer diagnosis, a lot of times if they're not surgical candidates, it could be because they have metastatic disease disease in other organs other than the primary organ, that it doesn't make sense to do the surgery because you have to also treat um, the disease throughout the body. One of the things I want to point out that physicians uh, always have in the back of their mind is their oath. And we mm -hmm. have taken an oath to do no harm. And so if we're thinking that you're already having an illness and if we do a procedure or a surgery on you, we may actually put you at a higher risk Many times physicians are going to tell you that they're reluctant to do that. Now you may think I'm willing to accept that risk, but we are morally and ethically bound to do no harm. And so that's why sometimes you'll run into physicians who who say I'm I'm not comfortable with that medicine, right. I'm not comfortable with that surgery, and I don't I don't recommend that. So it's not that they're trying to withhold care, they're trying to abide by the oath that they took mm -hmm. to cause no harm and to do things safely so when things like that happen you should really be asking questions to your physicians as to what could be the underlying cause and that that kind of leads us to the next thing that may be an indicator that your disease is, is very serious and that's that you are now being told that we're going to go to a third line mm. therapy. So we typically want to offer the best therapy first, the most efficacious therapy first, the one that's the the best tolerated first. So, you know, I hate the, the failure word, but that's a kind of a mm -hmm. dirty word. But that implies that you did not do well. And for whatever reason, that first line therapy failed to treat your illness. And so you used the second line therapy, which many times the second line became the second line because that was the thing that all that we had for many years and now it is not as popular because we've come out with something better. Third line is not generally the most expensive. It's usually very inexpensive, but it, it didn't do well for many people and that's why it dropped to the third place on the list. Yeah, and you also need to look at the risk and the benefit for you to doing that third line treatment. Ask lots of questions mm -hmm. of your clinicians and ask the tough questions so you can yeah. make a better um, What is assessment? a tough question to ask a physician? Well, why am I doing the third line treatment is one. Yeah. There's lots of tough questions. The tough question that a lot of patients ask me, and I tell them, go ahead, ask me, what would you do if this oh, was yes. you? I think that's a really tough question, and I think that's totally fair to put the physician on the spot and say, what would you do if this was you? What would you do if this was a family member that you liked, what would you what would you recommend to them? So put them on the spot and ask them. Yeah, ask those tough questions. You don't have to do that. You can choose for yourself, but ask them that tough question, right? And see what they see what they say. See how they respond. And ultimately, it's your decision. Yeah, yeah. it's so important. Uh, one of the other things on our list is um, skin. You know, skin is an organ. When we're talking skin in our um, our neck of the woods or in our patient population. Usually we're seeing, you know, pressure ulcers develop, shearing, skin tears, skin tears, skin breakdown. Um, you'll see little um, red dots, you know, on, on the skin, skin bruising. Um, these kind of things are important for you to look at and you have to get get to the bottom of it and know yeah. why it's happening. Yeah. Some um, skin rashes, conditions, issues are, are lifelong and maybe, you know, they're, they're not pleasant to look at. They're not pleasant to live with. They can cause sensation changes, but they're not necessarily indicative of serious illness. Right. But as we age, sometimes other skin conditions can occur that really do indicate serious illness and we don't necessarily have good treatments for them. So whenever your skin is having an issue, I think it's important to talk to your, your primary physician and I think it's important to talk to your skin doctor and ask them some honest questions about your prognosis, about your diagnosis, mm -hmm. and about what that means. Now for my patient population and Dr. T's patient population, when we start seeing those skin wounds that don't heal, that implies, you know, it may be a pressure problem, it may be a circulation problem. And 
for it to be an expanding wound or a chronic wound that, that won't heal, that's a worrisome sign. Yeah, and that usually is indicative of poor nutrition, meaning you may be eating and drinking well, but your body is not absorbing the proteins that you need in order to prevent that wound from worsening. I, I think that's a really good point. Yeah, you mm -hmm. can eat and drink, and just like the person who thinks that their diet hasn't changed and they're having the weight loss, even though you're putting those nutrients in your body, your body may not be absorbing them and may not be making them accessible to your body mm -hmm. like it used to, and that may imply that you have a serious illness. Progression and management of difficult uh, symptoms. Like also. edema, shortness of breath, mm -hmm. maybe pain. The automatic defibrillator senses what your heart rate is doing. And if it's a lethal arrhythmia, like ventricular tachycardia, it will shock. deliver a little shock directly to your heart from a device that's implanted in your chest. And if that's fired, that, I mean, that may m indicate that your heart disease is pretty serious. I mean, th just to qualify for an AICD, I think that indicates that your heart disease is, exactly. is and advanced. Then, and then when you're having talking about the difficult symptoms, like you mentioned edema and stuff, if they're already on a water pill, water pills or diuretics mm -hmm. help with that edema, but if it's getting worse with the medication, mm -hmm. um, usually that means we have to increase the medication and sometimes our body can't withstand the increase because their blood pressure is it's declining too low, or their or the kidney function isn't, isn't good enough. enough. So there's a lot of things that go, um, that factor in that you must look at mm -hmm. when you have these symptoms. An ability symptoms. to make urine is not necessarily the same thing as the ability to clean your blood. Yes. So I, you know, we'll, we'll go into that in more detail in a different session, but the ability to make urine does not necessarily imply that you're going to get rid of your fluid or you're going to get rid of the toxins in your blood. So sometimes they're giving you water pills and you're just not responding the way you used to. Right. Because your kidney function has di diminished. There's a whole list of certain abnormal lab values and, mm -hmm. and you know we call it numbers that should never cross. And we'll go into that in more detail in a, in a different video as well. But you know there are certain labs that we look at, albumin levels and protein levels and, and what's called an INR or International Normalized Ratio, sure. which is a mathematical calculation of your body's ability to clot blood. Uh, what's the creatinine level? What's your BUN? We look at the age and weight and body mass index of the patients. Yeah, and these numbers allow us in our profession for Dr. Bone and I who are doing palliative medicine to prognosticate and to really have a better understanding of um, the disease process and where they are at. Prognostication, I think she was, she just mentioned, I think is so important because it's information we want to pass on mm -hmm. to the patient. And it's, again, not that we want to be gloom and doom, but we want you to be prepared for what we see on your horizon. And when I talk to patients about prognostication, we don't have a crystal ball, but we do know what the book says about what the human mm -hmm. body in general is able to tolerate. And so we're trying to forecast how this disease is going to progress over time. And we want to be able to help prepare you so that you can have things accomplished, things set in priority that you feel are important to you. Yeah, and I think it's important when patients live longer than this stated time, it's it's great. Like it's mm -hmm. not that we're, we are Dr. Gloom and Doom. We do not want to take away hope, no. um, but it's very good to have understanding because as we've said uh, previously, information is power. Exactly. Infection, the uh, mm. infection with certain bacteria in, in particular implies that you may have a dysfunctional immune system or maybe antibiotics have caused you to have uh, certain bacteria that are resistant now to different antibiotics and recurrent hospitalization mm -hmm. to require you to have IV antibiotics. I mean, all of those indicate that you may have serious illness. So infection with certain bacteria may indicate that your immune system is not functioning well, that you've been exposed to a hospital, that you maybe work in a healthcare setting, right. but your immune system should be able to handle some of these infections and that you're needing IV antibiotics on a recurrent uh, basis to go to the hospital for. I mean, that indicates that there may be serious illness behind that. Yeah, and also I'd like to add, sometimes people don't realize that taking those IV antibiotics, the side effects that go along with it. I recently had 
um, a patient that was seeing an infectious disease doctor for this infection getting IV antibiotics at home for now it was day 35 and he began to have wow. trouble with his kidneys and his mentation began to get outrageous and his wife couldn't understand what was happening and it was really caused by the medication. So sometimes our medications can do harm over a length of time. When well, and, and this. they can cause diarrhea. Even mm -hmm. though you're getting it through your vein, those antibiotics may cause other infections that may kill off certain good bacteria that are in your body. And the only bacteria that you have remaining are bad, bad bacteria. bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then last on our list, we have certain imaging results. And we can talk about that more in detail. But when a person has certain imaging results, that may indicate serious illness. Oftentimes, mm -hmm. The physicians will say, well, it looks normal, but you will you now have access to your medical record mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. So you will see um, the idiosyncrasies of your results, and it's really important to be informed to know what those results really mean to you. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of diseases are not curable, mm -hmm. but we use medications, treatments, surgery to delay the progression of the disease and to try to prevent end organ damage. You know, we want everybody's organs to wear out at the same time. The reality is we're mortal and we are going to wear out. And the reality is that so far, people do die. That uh, life yes. is finite and, and we are mortal. But we don't want a person's heart to wear out when they're 50. We don't want their kidneys to wear out when they're 60. We don't want their right. lungs to wear out when they're 70. We would like everything to wear out at about the same time when they're much older. And so what we want to do is we want to delay that end organ damage. But this list that we've given you may be some other things that you can think about that may be indicators for you to talk to your physician. Is my, is my illness serious? Yeah, and I think it's really important for you to look, listen to this list, look at your own self, take notes. I really think um, taking notes and having the notes to compare and contrast from months uh, in the past to now always to have those comparisons to make yourself aware of where your illness can take you. It's so important. I have always encouraged patients, keep a copy of your labs, mm -hmm. keep a copy of your imaging results. You know, you can have your own medical record, particularly now that it is accessible oh, yes. and you can print it off at home. I think that's really important. You are the patient and you should be in charge. We're your medical guide. We're your medical expert. You know, when I go to the mechanic, I don't tell him how to fix my car. I go to the mechanic, I tell him it's not working right. And the mechanic fixes the car. And the and mechanic faith. tells me, this is what I think, you know, mm -hmm. you're, is going on with your car. This is what I recommend. I don't have to do that to my car. It's too expensive. My car's too old. I'm not going to do that. Or, oh my gosh, my car's worth a lot to me. I want it to run the best I possibly can. I know my mechanic. I trust my mechanic. I've been to that same mechanic for a long, long time. I'm going to do what they advise. And I think your physician is just as important as your mechanic. It's just a little bit different knowledge background. Yeah, and I think the point that Dr. Bone is making, which is very important, it's, it's up to you to make the decision as to where how you want your health care to go. It's not up to the physician. We're the medical expert. We can guide you. We can give you the information, but you need to be empowered by your choices. Make your own choices. So ask questions. If you think, gosh, I listened to that, and I do have some of those things. Maybe I have serious illness. Talk with your physician about it. Ask them, is my illness serious? What's gonna, what's gonna happen over the next five or 10 or 20 years with this illness? Is it serious? Is it not serious now, but it has that potential to be serious? Those are, you know, scary questions to ask, but maybe it's truth that you would like to know. Maybe it's something you would like to learn more about. We would love to hear from you. We wanna know if you've experienced any of this, if you have any other things that you think are serious illness, you know, indicators of certain illness, that we want this to be an open dialogue, communication back yeah, and forth. Yeah. And we want to empower you to make your own healthcare choices. Information um, and knowledge is, is power. We want to educate you and we want to be educated by you. So, you know, let us know if we've missed something. Uh, please leave, leave it in the comments and we can add it to our list. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks. Bye.